This is Artistic Intelligence, where we explore the intersection of art, sustainability, and technology. This show is brought to you in partnership with the United Nations ITU AI for Good, Changing the Story podcast, and State. Now let's join your co-hosts, Neil Sahoda and Michael Ashley. Welcome to another episode of Artistic Intelligence. We've got a world famous guest, Harry Yeff, also known as Reefs One. Harry is an ARS Prix Electronica nominated artist and musician based in London. His expertise in vocal musicianship and creative direction has generated an online global following, rendering over 100 million views and recognition as a pioneer of experimental vocalism. In 2018, Harry completed his third artist residency at Harvard University and is currently part of the Experiments in Art and Technology program at Bell Labs. Harry, welcome to the show. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, yeah, excited to, to speak to you both. Um, and yeah, it's, it's an exciting time globally. There's a lot of really interesting events going on when it comes to sort of future facing ideas. And yeah, it's good, good to be connected. Thank you for being here, Harry. Since this show is about changing the story, our listeners would like to know, what is the story about you? How did you become the artist that you are today? Um, I guess one small story that's kind of unexpected and connected to my relationship specifically with AI um was uh, i grew up as i as a tournament chess player like i grew up in quite a rough part of east london and um my dad bought me a uh, a very early um ai chess system which i used to play all the time and chess really helped me sort of think and create structure in my life not just uh in terms of planning and like understanding the world around me so music and uh, game theory and chess and AI was there from the very beginning um, and how we can be pushed by the tools that we use to become better. 
And as I got older, it became uh, obsessively focused on the human voice. So I have uh, a unique, one of the most unique ranges on the planet when it comes to vocals and to write and compose with uh, traditional and untraditional sort of singing techniques, percussion techniques, tone making techniques. Um, that became my absolute love. And I fell in love with my voice and other people's voices, making them think about the human voice. And that is a really exciting idea is how now technology can actually push us to go beyond our comfort zone with our understanding of the human voice and also the understanding of ourselves. So that's a, that's a crash course in, in me with a, a little unexpected story in there. No, that, that's awesome. I actually remember when I was watching a performance at the Egg Forget Summit in 2019, you were actually talking about that, you know, the human voice hasn't really been disrupted in like 50,000 years, right? What, what inspired you to go down this path on, on like in the vocals? Yeah, it's a strange one because you would think something as old as the human voice would be covered. Um, when we think of the body and anatomy, it's definitely an absolutely uh, precise science. Um, and yes, we do have linguistics, we do have phonetics, and the anatomy of the voice is an extremely sort of, uh, like there's so much conceptual rigor that goes with it. But in terms of actually how we use our voices and the potential of, of the things that we can do, there are new discoveries happening all the time. And over the last hundred years, um, the level of experimentation has been huge, uh, but in the last 10, there's been an explosion of voice culture. Uh, the ways that people can, just by using their bodies, make sounds um, has huge scope, not just in making music, but if you also think about the way that we communicate and the way that we connect, everyone listening now, the actual tone of my voice makes huge con contributions to how you psychoacoustically judge me effectively. You build this whole profile on me just by the, the timbre and the tone and the range of, of how I speak. And when you start thinking, okay, something so old, so primitive, can actually have new discoveries in it, I think that's just an extremely exciting space. So setting out to be one of the world's best at, at what I do and making waves in the voice world uh, has now extended to kind of can... Can we change the way we communicate? Can we change the way that we express? What are the benefits of that? And there's also huge implications for the voice as an interface. The way that we talk to each other, we interface into one another. And there's a lot of lessons in that for how maybe we can interface with technology and using the voice to interact with technology, you guys all know is a huge, huge subject now. So this whole world as an artist opened up to me and I realized that there's not many people uh, focusing on that, but there is a huge well of expertise in all these different fields. And as an artist, I can bridge the gap between all of these worlds and, and create um, a bunch of world firsts. It's really interesting that you say that. And I, I absolutely agree with you in terms of there's so much information that comes out from a voice. I think about listening to books on, on Audible. And I don't know if you ever had this experience, but sometimes I, I will like the content, but I can't stand the person's voice and it totally pulls me out. And at the same time, I think about how you, you look at someone like Morgan Freeman, when you hear that voice, you immediately trust what you're hearing. There's no, no accident that they picked him to play God in one of those movies. Um, but at the same time, uh, you're right. I mean, people aren't really experimenting with this, this very ancient, uh, I guess we call it technology, this, this uh, mechanism that we have. But I wanted to go back to something that you had talked about earlier um, when you said you have a profound range, I think is what, what you were saying. Um, it reminds me of Freddie Mercury. People talk about his range was, was very high as well in terms of what he could do with his voice. Um, I was curious, uh, how did you learn this? And then if you could walk us through why range matters so much and what you're able to do that perhaps other people cannot. Absolutely, because I guess like when we think of range and tone, we can often think in terms of our uh, speaking and singing voices. Um, but the truth is there are many other ways of creating sources of sounds um, from, uh, from not just our voices, but physically, the mechanisms that are there. And we often think as the voice as, as a linear thing. We have a tone and we shape it with the harmonics as, it's, as it leaves our body. Um, but actually, there are systems that you can control 
where you're able to be create a huge variations in uh, percussive sounds, tonal sounds. And some of these techniques are, are traditional uh, Mongolian throat singing, um, Tuvan throat singing, where you're controlling an extra harmonic over a bass tone. But then in more recent uh, sort of exploration in the 1960s, many jazz musicians who play brass, if you play a brass instrument, you'll know that you can make a buzz tone with your lips. And this is, this is one of the sources that passes through the brass instrument and creates the sounds that we all know today. But some of those uh, brass players started to actually sing through that buzz tone. So the note of the instrument and the buzz, you had a second note. And that's called multiphonics. So you're actually able, uh, through a pressure, to have two separate tones generating at the same time. And you're able to stack those and have like quite complex harmonies just from you. And those are, that's not linear. Those are, that's, that's two things happening at the same time. Um, plus the dynamics of the harmonics in between. And uh, that was uh, sort of revolutionized by people like Bobby McFerrin, who's like slightly more recent. But then you get to, to the two, 2000s onwards and you had the explosion of electronic music. And outside of singing and traditional techniques, like I mentioned, there became hundreds of sounds, not only techniques that maybe are used by everyone, but down to the genetics of your instrument. So the three of us in this room, we have quite different compositions, don't we? The size of our, our heads and the sort of um, elongation of our skulls and all of these things mean that we have optimum sounds, sounds that only we can do with a unique tone and timbre. So you have a, 150,000 now sort of new school, either beatboxers or vocal musicians, um, experimenting, finding all of these unique calibrations of what we see as sonically interesting sounds. And for me, I was hugely influenced by electronic music, so uh, especially in London. So it's something to uh, be walking through the area that I grew up and hearing uh, like electronic music, electronic sounds, producers, making original sounds and then that influencing me, the range of sounds became quite similar to that of a producer or an electronic composer who works with a laptop or uh, an electronic device. And you just would not think that type of range was physically possible. Um, but by going beyond just the spoken tone, all of these hundreds of different techniques come together to make what is one of the most dynamic and versatile instruments on the planet and it's being rediscovered every single day. So when I find a new sound with the voice and that can be myself in a music context or an academic content, uh, context, you can say that maybe this is the first time a human being has ever produced this sound. And yes, this is outside of language and you can think why does that matter? Uh, the reason it matters is because we should understand our bodies, we should understand the sounds that we make, and to find new things in this time is extremely exciting. So range is uh, huge, and it's hugely exciting. Yeah. I, I love that, Terry, because, uh, you know, we always think, like, what what's left to discover? <laughs> you know, we don't really think about sounds in the voice, and it's like there's so much untapped potential. Well, absolutely. Because then you then you think about in terms of the actual like motor functions, so the speed of how you can create and compose with the voice. So from thought straight to action, and it really tests our capacity as as machines, as as living machines. Is how fast, how far uh, can we push this? Because it's an absolute exemplary example of motor function control. So people who have extreme governance over their voices and control over their voices, it's one of the most complex physical acts in all of nature. And that's not, that's not my rhetoric. You can ask Sophie Scott, who's a yeah, neurologist, a cognitive neurologist at UCL, who I've worked with extensively. And when you start thinking objectively, existentially about sound making and the mechanism of the voice, it is a stunning piece of machinery. And we have to use that as much as we possibly can. And that, that's where I come in. That's cool. Well, that's, you know, I remember you, Harry, saying once that artists, uh, they open doors, right? They don't close doors, they actually open them. And one of the running themes I think that Michael and I have seen on this show so far is 
artists create a lot of opportunities and expression, you know, with, with all, all these new sounds and everything going on, what, what are you hoping that will people take away? Like, what's the message you, you want to promote? Well, if we're talking specifically about the art, and I guess like if we if we cut to like the chase when it comes to like the the use of technology, um, it's very easy to kind of think, well, why why do artists like uh, or, or like me or creatives around the world, why do they really matter when we're trying to solve problems? We're trying to work out how to cure world hunger. We're trying to um, understand the implications of nuclear power. We're trying to understand how cities are built. Why on earth? do artists matter in those conversations? And there, there's many responses to that, but the main one I go to and the main message I have is like artists are the governors of narrative. We're the ones that make sure that these very difficult ideas, these very complex technologies and these huge plans that we have for progression are understood by the masses and more importantly are accepted and felt and one issue we have is it doesn't matter how good an idea is, people will not just listen and acknowledge just because an expert has told them so. We are here to explore and create stories and experiences that allow the general public to catch up with the experts because that takes effort, it takes interest. And artists are the ones that can create that curiosity that ends up powering the interest. That means that these ideas are actually come to the surface and they do connect. And I think a real good example, which obviously is, is a huge talk of the town and it has been for the last few years is, is deep fakes, where you had, uh, this technology has existed for a long time, but it's only two artists started to break, um, misuse and experiment with the technology that it blew up in the general vocabulary and you now have the the world has an awareness of this technology and that leads to guidance it leads to better sort of legislation so if we want people to care artists are the ones that can generate that curiosity um but the other side of my work particularly is i don't want it to end there i'm so interested in what is the role of artists in research and how can we contribute to a, a more consistent sort of quantifiable structure so that artists can be brought into, into institutions and really contribute to the guidance of how human beings might interact with new technologies. And you can really see uh, the benefits of having artists in the beginning, making sure that the ideas are being tested because they're a different bank of expertise. We bring a different angle and oh my God, do we need as many angles on these problems as, as, as possible? Because um, I've had a number of experiences with being some of the smartest people in the world and we are desperate to answer some of these issues and artists really can help see things laterally in, in a brand new way. Um, I, I couldn't agree more. I, I think you put it extremely well about the importance of artists creating the narrative that we live by. And the word that comes to mind when I hear you say that is accessible. You take something that is uh, an idea that might be outside of the norm, something that's challenging the status quo. And in some ways you have to create a narrative that makes it accessible for people to understand it. Like you said, you might have a very compelling idea, but people can't get behind it. Then where does it go? And the example I often give to people about my profession of being a storyteller is uh, why do we tell parables to children? We tell them to, to young people to, to help them make sense of the world. If you just told them an idea, they might not understand it. It might not stick with them. And so you think about the nursery rhymes, the parables that you heard as a child, you can probably still remember the message even now because of that technology. Um, so I, I, I couldn't agree more with what you're saying. Um, knowing where you want to go with your art and knowing about how you want to impact the world, could you then, could we uh, uh, transition our conversation to talk about what are the things that you're doing for those that, that, that aren't aware of your work, if we could get a, a taste of, of what you're doing in this medium and the, the art that you're putting out there. So over the past four years, I've worked with a number of different institutions, but effectively I tried to find uh, world-class uh, creatives, programmers and engineers and bring them together over the governing of creative direction 
to try and produce, as we said, not only uh, works that make people maybe connect with a complex idea in a difficult way, but my personal mission, which is to make people think about the human voice. So a few examples of that uh, would be, one is an ongoing project with an incredible uh, creative director called Rama Alam um, and a post-production company called The Mill in New York, where we developed a tool called C-Sound. So myself as a musician, I compose and write and sing and play with my voice. Um, but there is often a really interesting connection to how people can actually uh, shout, scream, share what they do with their voices. But there's a huge anxiety that comes with that. To make we decided to think about how can we use technology to make people have a connection to the idea that the voice is precious. So C Sound is a digital sculpting tool. And what it does is the general public can enter a space and as they speak or sing or say I love you to their partner, you can see that voice sculpted in solid gold and platinum and steel. And you see what is a digital simulation of a physical idea that comes from the voice. And what's so interesting with that experiment in particular is when we have quite shy people, people that would not normally express, when they use the tool and they see their voice manifest in a huge way, they start to scream and shout and open up. And I call that an augmented relationship with technology. So when they actually sit down with an installation or a piece of work that they can play with in real time, that connection is that I see as an augmentation. And you end up having behaviors or ideas um, change. So the technology can actually mine from us the behaviors and the sort of actions or skills or expertise that we want to mine from ourselves. So that concept of augmenting with technology is consistent in all the projects that I do. Um, and an extension of that is actually the idea to not just augment, but to be opposed by. So me as a, as a professional vocalist and performer, I uh, worked with Dada Bots and Bell Labs to produce a piece of content where I actually developed a second self, a vocal second self that uh, was trained on about uh, four, four to five hours of me performing. And we actually used this outcome um, and this generative audio as an opponent, just like in chess, but in, me in the context of music. So de de designing an AI opponent who can push me, battle me in my expertise that I'm world class in uh, was a really exciting idea that it's with C sound, it was more about collaboration, but with second self, it was more about an opponent. And obviously the concept of in chess and game theory and AI opponent is very old. When it comes to the arts, having an opponent is an extremely exciting idea. And me and my team wanting to pioneer that concept of opponent design and AI systems that push us further can be a little bit controversial because the idea of an opponent or something that pushes back in us, we don't normally associate with the idea that that is actually a wholesome fear. It's something that works with us. So I believe opponents to also be collaborators and designing AI systems and tools and working with world leading programmers to continue that journey is absolutely a goal. And uh, over lockdown, um, I used uh, a process called Wubu. Um, CJ Carr from DadaBots um, helped build me a patch where I'm actually able to create a real-time AI opponent trained on any musician that I want. So I had some of my favorite musicians to collaborate and battle with um, over the lockdown period because I had no other way of having real-time uh, music sort of collaboration because I, I was locked away. So these systems, uh, using them as a mirror to, to see myself more and push me further is an absolute like, key idea. And the portfolio keeps growing. Um, but I'll, I'll keep it to just those two for now. Well, I want to jump in one thing before Neil comes back, because that, that, that's absolutely fascinating. I've never thought about it that way. But it reminds me of something, which is, if you think going back to storytelling, you think about what the hero's journey is. The idea behind the hero's journey is you have an ordinary world, you have a person that doesn't want to engage in an adventure, it's actually resistant in the beginning. 
but the process of conflict, because conflict is the whole seed, the whole engine behind dramatic storytelling, it's giving you an opponent. And that opponent can, can um, assume many forms. It could be the antagonist, it could be the, the bad guy, whatever it is. Um, the point is, it's forcing the protagonist to have the internal change, to have the internal transformation. And so what you're saying makes perfect sense. If you have an opponent, it's getting, it's uh, evoking the best in you. It's challenging you from without and from within to, to get better. And when you mentioned that, uh, the first thing that comes to mind are, are rap battles. I don't know if that's something you, you did there, but if you think about, I think about the rap battle, especially in Hamilton, and if you are forced with your AI counterpart to, to engage in that, it's actually making you better. It's making you stronger in the same way that a fighter is training to get better at their craft as well. So anyway, it blew my mind when you said that. I thought that was very interesting. Well, no, so, exactly. So if we think of sports, we think of other games, the, the kind of ghost that's two steps ahead of us. I think we've all had a friend get better at us at something that we enjoy. Um, yeah. The idea of competition between, between friends and the, the issue with being extremely good at something is it can sometimes actually be hard to have that reference point that you maybe had in your development, which is someone that is just a bit better than you. And I feel like uh, the use of AI across the board to actually see not necessarily a thousand steps ahead, but even two, <laughs> uh, and, and maybe to be able to predict and assess how you would like to grow, I think is a very interesting idea. And when it comes to something very quantifiable, um, say like a hundred meter race where, okay, I want to know where I need to be um, in the, and the types of training I need to do and what it would look like for me to actually beat my time. When it comes to the art, it gets a little bit more complex because it's a subjective. There's not an objective sort of winning um, solution, but, the, but the, the sort of methods and the ideas that come with an opponent um, is something that I don't hear many people embrace. And I think it's one of the most exciting aspects of AI is to be able to design and, and create opponents, a, a second self, a data self that pushes you further. So, so I want to plant that seed in people and and when people describe me or think of me to, uh, to continue making opponents for the greater good, not to, to kind of replace us or, or push us down, but to grow, I want that to, idea to stay with people because that's what me and my team really specialize in. And, and I'm a living example of that. The way that I now perform and some of the sounds that I, uh, I utilize, which I, we, we can show in, in a clip um, soon, um, have been totally influenced by the hyper control, um, which is the, the, totally inspired by me, me using AI systems and seeing what uh, a solution or an outcome that I have not produced and in turn that inspiring me to become more. Yeah, so you're essentially flipping the script here, Harry, in that, you know, there's so much focus on human versus machine, right? And there's a great fear about the machines rising up and eradicating humans, conquering the world. And you got some people talking about, no, it's a tool and we're augmenting our intelligence. But you're actually saying that this kind of constructive conflict could actually be good and unlock our more potential out of us. Maybe make us help be more human, be more artistic. And that's an incredibly novel concept. How, how does this translate into like maybe forms of art where maybe there's not really direct competition? Well, it has to come from the self. I think um, the greatest opponent we could ever face is, is ourselves. And as you will know, AI systems uh, are often curated or directed by um, uh, sort of people's bias or, or interest anyway. Um, and there is no truly autonomous AI system yet. Um, so these are human beings using tools and I feel like the, the, same, the same human beings that are building these tools can actually work with individuals who are obsessed with self-growth. And artists are obsessed with getting better at what they do. They're obsessed with challenges and maybe suffering for the growth of their art and putting themselves and learning about experiences. And the, the curation and the direction that can come from artists sort of taking concepts like AlphaGo and trying to 
create uh, competition-like environments that don't necessarily need to have an outcome, but even if you are generating 100 pieces of work which are trained on a specific visual artist data set, you're, actually, you're able to, to work through those and curate and pick and, and augment and fuse with that process. So just by having a, a chess-like call and response with any system, a conversation, a stroke for stroke in visual art, a sound for sound in music, I think there's many, many interesting uh, dynamics which we can see arise in, in the next few years. Um, but another fundamental idea I have is as artists like myself, and there are others who are building these data selves, they're building these the collection of systems that they kind of personify in some way, they in themselves have the capacity to collaborate with other second selves. So having maybe what is a, uh, a system that I use uh, with CJ Carr from, from Dada Bots to create music um, could end up collaborating or working with a system that Arca uses, who's another musician, or Holly Herndon. And the idea is that those audio um, generative sort of forms of AI could then inspire or collaborate visual art sort of systems. There's no reason why you can't get this generative sort of sequential inspiration between artists, second selves. Um, and I think that's a really exciting thing. And it's very crude by a, a friend of mine who has a, a very different way of saying things, um, which I really appreciate, said, so it's like Pokemon for artists, so AI Pokemon for artists. And I was like, well, no, but, but that is actually quite a good way to, for people that maybe don't know about um, technology or how it works to, to think about that you can grow these and generate these second selves that can go out into the world and collaborate. And um, I think that's really, really exciting. I, I totally agree. Um, so if we could take this moment right now to slip a few different pieces uh, of, of work you've done that you could share with, with the audience, we would love that. Well, absolutely. So the first piece you're going to see here is an example of Second Self. Um, and Second Self is, as I mentioned, the, the generative uh, vocal sculpting tool. Um, and you can see how a human voice can actually build what is a simulated digital sculpture. Mind blown. <laughs> <laughs> you know, Harry, I'm, I'm always curious because we, we see the stuff that we can do with 
technology and art and how we can amplify our capabilities. There's the raging debate, could like AI ever create? You know, do, can we teach it imagination? I mean, what can we actually do with this stuff? Is there a concept of like an AI masterpiece? I mean, what, what would that be? So it's, it's interesting, isn't it? Because AI systems are so established in the, in the sort of zeitgeist when it comes to, for example, if we were to try and uh, actually I spoke about this in the article for AI for Good, but if we were to try and design a new approach to traffic systems in smart cities, I think using technology to try and work that out um, is seen as a, a really established sort of uh, smart thing to do and not just rely on the human mind alone to, to create that system. Um, but when it comes to art, we have this very interesting pushback that systems, um, they are uh, in, in sort of, uh, they push it back against creativity and human beings are the sole creators of uh, of the work that happens and we as as uh, as systems have total ownership and I do believe that that energy that intention will never not be the case I think we definitely are the ones creating these systems there's a lot of incredible creativity and beauty that goes into designing an AI system so the, the problem isn't really there the issue is is I think again it's a zeitgeist thing I don't think people have the, the sort of interest to really understand the system so you can't have a masterpiece because the zeitgeist will push back on that and the fact that because there's a system in between a human intention and an outcome therefore it's not human but the problem we have is the concept of mastery and a masterpiece is in question on the whole even like ideas like superstars like absolute you have the rare cases of some people like Billie Eilish who I would consider a genuine superstar now but they're actually uh, the idea of, of, of something being so celebrated and uh, the magnus opus of, of creativity that idea people are really challenged by it and I honestly believe that the opportunity of working with AI is a real opportunity to really go beyond anything that has ever happened artistically before. And if you think in terms of the concept of mastery in a traditional sense, you have your Leonardo da Vinci's, your Turner's, who um, have unquestionably been uh, people that create masterpieces. And it's not so much about the artistry it's actually computing is something that masters did not have. If I'm going to create an attempt to make a masterpiece now in visual art, the issue is, is we have now as a zeitgeist, as a collective sort of mind associated uh, a, a masterpiece with the past, something that has gone. And technology really allows us to use computing as a new medium we do not have the masters of computing in the art. And I think that's such an interesting idea. So when I was talking about the concept of, okay, so what is something beyond anything that's happened before? And I like to ask the question, uh, which sounds like random, human beings can take huge pride in their destructive power. It's seen as a huge marker of achievement is their ability to destroy. And not everybody kind of thinks in those terms, but if you look through history, that tends to be what is noted, what is remembered. And one of the greatest, uh, if not the greatest form of destruction is the invention of the nuclear bomb. What is the opposite of a nuclear weapon in terms of creation? in the amount that a nuclear bomb can destroy, do human beings have the capability to create with equal opposition? I believe that systems like artificial intelligence are the only ways that we can match the amount that we can create as opposed to the amount that we can destroy. As single human beings, we have reached mastery uh, in many, many forms and we, re we have revealment for what has happened before but I think there is a new creative age coming when we can use artificial intelligence to create as much as we have destroyed and that is a really really exciting idea and 
myself and my peers, the aim is to try and try and push it there. So it's an abstract way of describing it, but some of those ideas might stick in the mind. And uh, the observations that these systems allow us are truly beautiful. They are sensitive, they are human guided, and they are remarkable. And it's the only chance to do something that has never, ever truly happened before. I don't know if you've ever uh, listened to, Ter you know who Terrence McKenna is, Terry? I don't know if you've ever listened to some of his uh, videos. Um, they're, they're all over YouTube and they're fantastic. His books are really good too, but you remind me of him in the way that you're putting forth these ideas. Cause I hadn't thought about that before um, from opponent theory to, um, to talking about the, uh, the opposite of a, a nuclear bomb. But um, I think that you're providing people in addition to your, to your music, obviously, and to, what we've been talking about throughout this conversation. I also think that you're providing an, an ideological framework for people to, again, usher in these, these ideas to make them accessible, as we mentioned earlier. And I think it's really, really interesting. Um, before we, we, we close, I'd like to, to hear from you. What are your thoughts um, as to the future? What does it look like in, in the realm of technology, in the realm of art? And then coupled with that, if you could also share any advice that you would have for up and coming artists. So that's the biggest question you've asked me. Um, <laughs> but right now, I think one of the key ideas that's really staying with me is that it, all it takes is one person to become ill for it to affect all of us. And outside of thinking with a, a futurist mind, uh, being an engineer, being a, a thinker of any regard, a lot of the ideas we would take pride in would have a direct connection to what we see as the future. And we were thinking in maybe years or generations, but actually now we see that all it takes is one person to be sick. Actually, the innovations that we consider, they need to help us tomorrow and next week, not necessarily just uh, being very proud of how they may manifest in 20 years. So as an artist, now my, my focus is on how we can kick up conversation. How can we make sure people are inspired to talk to one another? And having a real relationship with technology is going to have a genuine sort of direct impact on how governments uh, roll out systems that are truly emba embraced by the nations um, that, that they are rolling it out to. And if we are doing mass testing, if we are doing vaccination, these are difficult problems. These are tough, tough problems. And they require human beings wanting to embrace it. Real people from all backgrounds, not just commercial, academic, and political spheres. And that requires uh, some of the ideas that we've spoken about today, and specifically the arts, to help. And if you've got world-leading experts across the field in terms of world-class everything um why isn't there world-class communication and world-class marketing and world-class creativity to go along all of that world-class sort of uh, connections and i do believe that technology has to be embraced and that artists are going to, going to be responsible over the next week to 15 years and we will be the deal breakers if, if these narratives if these ideas actually connect in a way that is most efficient. So in the short term, I'm thinking about voices and composing and writing with AI and trying to make incredible art that opens people's minds. Um, but I do see a future where artists really have a meaningful seat in global problem solving stages. And my work with the World Economic Forum, with United Nations, with Harvard University, with UCL, and with my community and my musicians and my artists is all in the spirit of fighting for the arts as a problem solving tool, not just a decoration. I, uh, I can never look at the same way in the human voice again, Harry. So I, and I thank you for that. I'm a little curious and maybe it's a bit, a bit of a selfish and big ask, you know, is there any way we can get a, some sneak peek or insight into what your next big project's gonna be? So there's a number of things that I'm working on at the moment. Um, we're, we're actually putting together the, um, the framework for designing the world's largest AI-assisted choral composition. So we're trying to have 
uh, some incredible minds help a huge number of singers uh, harmonize with, um, with AI systems, literally and um, metaphorically speaking. Um, and also trying to use uh, AI systems and technology to explore harmony as a whole, having human beings actually, and, and the natural world be paired with uh, technology. So this idea of continuing voices as almost testing grounds to show how that we can connect on a, on a very large scale, uh, I'm extremely excited about that. Um, there's also another project where we have uh, managed to collaborate um, with a number of uh, sound artists and technicians and um, Phil and Thomas here in, in the UK uh, we've recorded the sounds of uh, some trees that were in Hiroshima and they actually survived the blasts um, exactly 75 years ago and they overcame radiation um, and the, uh, the technology used to record the trees is incredible um, but we are now using that as a compositional tool to work with a number of vocalists who have actually had laryngectomies and they've lost their voices and they're singing again. So it's an extremely interesting time to be uh, exploring how we can bring technology and voice together. Uh, but most importantly, we need new connections. People still need ambitious art and we still need to be having big ideas and keep the conversation going. And all these larger pieces of public art and sculptures and performances and techniques that I do is all there to just try and inspire people to use their voices to speak up and to connect. Well, we wow. We very much agree with you on that. If people want to learn more about what you're doing and, and get in touch with you, how, how can they do so? Um, you can find me on my website, which is reaps100.com. So that's 100, R-E-E-P-S, 100.com. Uh, you can find me on Instagram, which is a great way to get in touch at, at reaps1, R-E-E-P-S-O-N-E. Um, and I think through here, uh, you'll be able to maybe find some, some contacts, but the website and Instagram, um, is, is great. And yeah, I'm always open to ideas and taking things one step further and trying to push for, for world first. So more knowledge, more conversation is better. And me and my team are always open. Um, and it's been great to, great to chat. Fantastic. We'll make sure that all that information is in the show notes for the audience. Harry Reaps One, thank you so much for sharing your story, being a phenomenal, innovative, disruptive artist, and inspiring all of us to uh, maybe seek our second selves. <laughs> yeah, yeah, find your second self, it's useful. <laughs> thank you again. Hey, if you like today's show, please remember to hit the like button and leave a comment. If you've been enjoying the Changing the Story podcast series, please subscribe and share it with your friends. Thank you. Thank you.